Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Uh, marami marami salamat po for giving me this opportunity to worship God with you this morning. Uh, my name is Cesar Lopez. Um, greetings from Los Angeles out to our ICOC Philippine Family of Churches. Uh, we love you so much. So excited to be able to worship God with you and to share with you some insights uh, guided by the Spirit of God and helping us all become more like Christ. I want to give a special shout out to just your leadership group for allowing uh, me this privilege to be able to uh, come to you this morning. Uh, so grateful for there's so many people I could think of and list out, but uh, I'm just so thankful for all the great memories of uh, spending time with the Los Lados, the Aquinos, the Maramaras, uh, the Montalegres, the Casas, the Cabatsans, the Monjes. Um, so thankful for all the way that you impacted our family and, and truly some of our best friends in the whole world and the kingdom. Uh, Coco and Frida, we uh, love you guys so much. And a special, special love to just the brothers and sisters in, in the Philippines. Um, we lived there for 16 years and some of our fondest times. As Christians, we spend most of our time, uh, when we looked at it the other day, Jennifer, we were talking 16 years uh, in the Philippines was uh, very significant to us that we will never forget. All three of our children were born and raised in the Philippines. And uh, the Philippines is very close to our hearts. And I want to say thank you. Because I know specifically in 1993, a uh, dream came true as we moved there in 1993. Three years later, uh, my father made a decision to make Jesus Lord of his life and was baptized back then in, I believe, Fort Bonifacio. So really, from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you for the way you impacted my family, uh, my father, and the way you're impacting so many lives. I have a very special treat today as I share with you. I have my son that's going to be helping me out with the sermon as we uh, share God's worth with you today. Greetings from Los Angeles and the United States. A lot of things are happening on this side of the world. Uh, we're living in a very challenging time. We're living in a dark time here in the U.S. Uh, not only are like you and I, we're experiencing the, the COVID pandemic, but we're also experiencing a lot of racial tension right now, fueled by systematic injustice and killings committed against African Americans. And through all of that, there's a lot of pain and tears and fears and uncertainty. But through all that, still, the power of the Holy Spirit is moving. And things are happening as people are coming together to take a stand and speak up against the sin of hatred and injustice and prejudice. My hope is that in the next 20 minutes or so that we can continue to what Coco and really shared with us last week in this powerful message about being courageous and being a light. And today I'd like to ask you and encourage you is to listen to where the Holy Spirit is trying to get your attention today. In your home, in your community, the Spirit of God is moving not only to get our attention, but also to encourage us to participate in ways to engage, to be an agent of change, to be a disciple of Christ, to be the light, despite what's going on. Like Paul came to the church in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 13, he came to the church that was very disunited. There was so much tension, so much turmoil in a broken world. Paul said that he was compelled by the love of Christ. He was reminded that Jesus died for all, not just one type of people, but for all. He reminded the church back then that, hey, we because of Jesus, we no longer look at the world from a worldly point of view. It's changed. It's changed. The transformation in us has shifted everything upside down that we no longer see it the way people see it. Where there's no hope, we have the opportunity to see hope. Why is that? Because you and I has not only been transformed, but we have a message. And you know what that message is? It's the message of reconciliation. To help people come back together after a fight. To help people come back together after being far from God. To help people who are different from one another, that don't like each other, be one through Christ. And how do we do that? When you and I are compelled by Christ. 
So my title today is Compelled by the Love of Christ. To be motivated, to be transformed, and to make a difference and continue to be a light because we're motivated by the love of Christ. You and I are here today because Christ has changed our lives. And hey, if you're visiting here for the first time, we want to say thank you for being here. And wherever you're at today, go ahead and write in the chat, say amen. We're here because the love of Christ. And that's what's going to make a difference. That's what's going to help us to continue to be a light no matter how dark the world is. And in Ephesians chapter 2, believe it or not, racism, hatred, bigotry, and prejudice was not new to the church. Going back to the New Testament, racial division has been a virus in the church for thousands of years. At the birth of Jesus, there was deep hatred between six different groups. The Jews versus the Gentiles. The masters versus the slaves. The males versus the females. There's no such thing as equal rights under the law. There was deep division that crossed the line of race, religion, and gender. Bigotry was huge and was deeply ingrained in the culture that the Jewish men had a certain prayer. A prayer that went like this. Dear God, I thank you for not creating me into a Gentile slave and especially a woman. Can you imagine that type of arrogance? Bigotry defined is the fact of having expressing a strong unreasonable beliefs and disliking the people who have different beliefs or in a different way of life. It's the, it's the attitude of being superior, saying that I am better than you. And that was the prayer that they had. This was a toxic culture Jesus was born into, and nobody questioned it except Jesus. But even Jesus' 12 disciples had deep, racist, prejudicey attitudes towards one another. They felt Jews were superior to Gentiles, masters were superior to slaves, and men were superior to women. That was the world. And here's the crazy part. The crazy part is that all six of these groups showed up to church. Can you imagine the problems? Racism, hatred infected the early church that it was racially divided. God has a solution to the problem. And Paul takes this solution to the tension that was going on between the different groups, between the hatred, the prejudice, and the answer is Jesus. Paul wanted them to understand how important unity is to the kingdom of God. Our unity in the kingdom of God is a bright light and gives hope to many people. Matter of fact, I remember what inspired my dad. One of the things that inspired my dad to study the Bible, to go to church, was that he saw that people really loved one another. And it gave him hope that he could change at his stage of life. And see, that's what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 to 18. Turn with me as we look there, or turn your Bible on, and this is what Paul says to the church in Ephesus. You've got to keep in mind, you got the different groups there. They don't like each other. And he says this to them. But now in Christ, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier dividing the wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law and its commands, and its regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one humanity out of two, thus making peace, and in one, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who were near. 
For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Wow! Paul communicates this where there's so much tension. And can you imagine the, the feeling at church with strong feelings? And he reminds him of Jesus, once we were far from God, but brought near. You and I, many of us here today, we were far from God. But because of Christ, we were brought closer to God because of the blood of Jesus. And we were able to get peace. And that's what he said. He gave us peace. Jesus united the Jews and the Gentiles into one people. And he put his own body on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought good news of peace to the Gentiles who were far from him and peace to the Jews who were near him. And he told him, look at this promise. I love that part. He says, look at this promise. All of us who can come to the Father can come to the Father with the same Spirit because what Jesus did for us. That Spirit of God is powerful. And you and I have that Spirit. See, our unity is based on Jesus first. That's why Paul was telling them, yes, you came from here, yes, you were there, but because of Jesus, it's changed. And because of that, we are now brothers and sisters. We are united. And he wanted to remind them that our unity is based on Jesus first. He reminds them that, yes, Jesus is a bridge from here to there. As Christians, we are a bridge. We help people go from here to there. But Paul says that Jesus is not only bridge, but he's also a sledgehammer. He's just wrecking ball that breaks the dividing wall of hostility, that breaks down the walls that separates us from our prejudices, our hurts, our differences. Jesus breaks down that not just any wall, but a wall of hostility. And at that time, nobody spoke into the hostility except Jesus. In other words, our relationship with God is connected in how we have relationship with others. Because of God, we can change the way we look at someone who was different. Because of God, we can have deep relationships with someone we never thought we can, if not for the blood of Christ. God takes down whatever causes hostility between humans and because of Jesus, we are allowed to be one. You and I are a bridge, but we are also called to intentionally break down any wall of hostility that divides people because of hatred, prejudice, racism, or bigotry. Groups were bitterly divided are now united. They are one family. The Spirit of God is leading us to listen to those who feel marginalized, not heard, not valued. Leading us to be like Christ, to bring good news to the poor, the freedom for the prisoner, and help for those who feel oppressed. That's what I feel like God is calling us here in America, calling me to listen and to hear what's going on. Not only that, but to participate in bringing down any walls that can divide humans from being one under Christ. But to break down the walls of hostility that divides people, I need to make sure I remove any walls that cause disunity between my wife and I, between my brother and sister, between my children, by anyone else. Being born and raised in Los Angeles, I grew up in the family business. And before I was a Christian, I had one goal in life, was to be the most successful Filipino-American I could possibly be. And 
My parents worked hard to provide and give us everything that they could so we can have a better uh, opportunity. But in that course, I remember seeing my family being mistreated and abused by people of different color, from black, brown, white, yellow, even from my own race. You know, my dad taught me to not focus on the color of skin. No matter what they did to my mom and dad, after seeing so much abuse and mistreatment, he always turned to me and said, son, don't worry about the color of their skin. But you focus on one color, and that's green. And he really instilled in me the importance of being successful. That you grow up and you focus on one color, and that's green, money. And when you become successful, all colors of skin will go to you. I thought that was pretty cool growing up. And I did work hard. And I did have a lot of uh, uh, high ambitions whether it's business, whether it's politics. But I'll never forget what it did instill in me was a sense of bigotry, meaning that I will be successful and everyone else will be below me. And an attitude of superiority that I am better than you. And it was very subtle. But then I'll never forget when the cross changed my life. How Jesus changed my life. I'll never forget going to the Philippines as a missionary to serve for 16 years. Help me change. And that wall was taken down. But here's the thing. I've got to make sure that wall stays down. I've got to make sure that wall of hostility that can divide me and allow me to become prideful is continuously destroyed and continuously taken down. The cross of Jesus allows reconciliation, allows two to become one, allows those far from God to come close to God, allows hope, and no matter how much hurt we may cause people, that our sin may cause it hurting other people, no matter injustice that we see, our hope is that in Christ, we can have that kind of reconciliation in our marriage, in our family, in our friendships, with our enemies, racial reconciliation. See, the government and culture will never completely give a solution to this because it doesn't include the cross. See, to follow Jesus, we have the power to override division and bond us to God. Jesus united the Jews and the Gentiles into one people. I love that biblical unity of imagination it's a dream that God wants you and I to fulfill, and it's very possible when you and I are compelled by the love of Christ. At this time, I'm going to have my son, Daniel Lopez, who's a college student out here at Pepperdine University in L.A., come and share with you some thoughts. Hello, the Philippines Church. What a blessing it is to be sharing with you this morning. Again, my name is Daniel Lopez, and I'm the son of Cesar Lopez, who you just saw. Um, I'm currently a college student. I'm a second year student at Pepperdine University along the coast of Los Angeles. You know, as you are right now, I'm in quarantine, um, and I can't help when I hear the word walls to think about the very walls that I'm surrounded by on a daily basis. You know, we, take, we talk about Jesus breaking down walls of hostility. When I think about, when I think about those walls, I can't help um, but keep on reminding myself of the place that I'm stuck in. COVID-19, the very thing that relates you and I today, is tough. Sometimes I feel stuck. You know, as I read the news, I get discouraged. As I look at the job that I lost, the internship that I lost this summer, I can get discouraged. You know, sometimes to make things feel better for myself, I look through pictures and videos of this past year, trying to look for memories that I'm scraping for, normalcy that I'm scraping for. And maybe you, too, are looking for a sense of normalcy. And I get it. I totally get it. But oftentimes it's hard because it can sometimes divert our view from God, our trust from God. It's, it's tough because sometimes, you know, I notice my posture getting lower and lower <laughs> as I'm looking at screens for too long. Or sometimes when I step on the scale, I notice my weight getting higher and higher. Discouragement all across the board sometimes. However, I hope 
this morning you can take a chance with me to look into something that we can truly hope for, and that's God. You know, my dad talks about the walls of disunity between one another, but I want to address the walls of disunity that exist in our very hearts. And yet, while the walls of my room may be hard to see the light through, it's truly the walls of my heart that tend to be the thickest and the hardest to deal with. Deep and ongoing discouragement over and over again, and it never stops. Some of you have felt this way. Some of you have spiraled into depression. Some of you perfectionists and planners, I know that I am one, have had everything in front of you fall apart. And instead of one episode on Netflix, now it's a season a day. <laughs> I've definitely been there. Sometimes it's harder to smile, and sometimes it's harder to see the light. In all honesty, I have been fighting this battle in my heart between am I allowing, uh, who am I allowing to be more powerful? Is it the truth of God or is it the lies of Satan? And like many of you, the truth of God has been so hard to see recently. And maybe the walls of your heart are the very walls that Jesus is desiring to break down. You know, my dad earlier described Jesus as a sledgehammer sometimes. And maybe that's what's needed right now. You know, I was tempted to think of a church service as a performance as I was writing this. But I soon came to realize that as your brother in Christ, that I don't live a perfect life of redemption in Christ. I struggle and I get discouraged so easily. So instead of painting a perfect picture, I welcome you to journey with me and fight the good fight because we pursue a relationship with God that is perfect. I hope you can journey with me because that's, that's what this is about, persevering, journeying. You know, the greatest commandments talk about loving God and loving one another. My dad mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, 2 Corinthians, talking about how Christ's love compels us. That he died for me and for you. And this verse after that, verse 17, talks about how the old has gone and the new is here. And how all of this is from God. You know, my favorite scripture is the chapter before that, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. And it says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This virus, unemployment, the struggles of our family, all around us, the struggles of our society, racial injustice, mental health. All of that is seen. But what is unseen is the one thing that our hearts need right now. And what better promise to look forward to than to our own reconciliation with God. So I encourage you today to not only look at how Jesus broke down the walls of social injustice back then, but how you can look at your own heart today and break down the walls of your heart that Satan has built up. Be vulnerable with one another. Listen to one another. Suffer with one another so that you can also rejoice with one another. And let the love of Christ build the bridges in your heart that reconciles you with God and with each other. This gives me so much hope. And although we are across on opposite sides of the world, I know that the Spirit is working, and I know that you know the Spirit is working behind the scenes. It's just hard to see right now. So I hope that this morning you can take a chance to really acknowledge that light. I hope you can ingrain that hope into your hearts right now that you are not suffering in vain. We are not suffering in vain here, and you are not suffering in vain there. So the Philippine Church, I love you so much. Um, you are my roots. You are my family. Um, and I thank you for letting me share with you today. I'm so grateful Daniel was able to share his heart. And it is truly a great reminder that I know for me, what God is teaching me right now in 2020 in June, is that I got to go so much deeper in my love for God. And I got to so much deeper in my love for one another. And... Truly, that can be a light wherever we're at, whether it's COVID, whether it's tension or grief, whether it's being a light 
in a dark place where there's so much tension and hatred that loving God, loving one another has to go so much deeper. So I want to give you three questions. Three questions that I like to encourage you to ask. Ask your family, ask your Bible talk, ask one another in your discipling times so that can help you go deeper in our love for one another that can glorify God. The first question is this. In your family growing up, what groups or people were you taught not to trust? Even the best of families can pass down negative things about race, differences of other people, directly or indirectly. Those are the conversations we're having here in America. To look deeper, in order to love one another, we've got to figure out why is it hard to love one another. Question number two. Who were the people you were taught to fear or not trust? I love the ministry that I'm in and my fellow partners in the gospel is one is Gary and Claudia Smith. Uh, Gary is African American. Claudia is African American and half Korean. Uh, we have also another couple, Dave and Teresa Lawson. Uh, he's a uh, white brought up in Philadelphia and she's Filipina. Actually, they were in the Philippines and had a great time. And then our elder, Tita Jerry and Tita Erlin. Uh, she's Filipina. He's Jewish. And what a great conversations we have. And, and I asked Gary this question, and with his permission, I said, who are the people you were taught to fear? And being brought in the South and being African American, he was taught to not trust white people. Because all of the abuse and all of the experiences, negative experiences that they experienced growing up, it was ingrained in him not to talk, not to trust white people. Because of crises change. But there's something also in our family that's passed down. We've got to look deeper. If we want to love each other, we've got to figure out what was it that taught us to fear other people or other groups. Here's the last questions. Last question that you can ask is what are the ways you can grow deeper in your love for one another. You know, these questions will create deeper conversations, deeper appreciations, but I pray will also help us understand the importance and the value of what you and I have in Christ. See, hatred, racism, the idea that one is superior than the other is evil, that one group is less than the others, but having this opportunity to go deeper in love for God and for one another, what happens, we begin to remove blind spots. And we begin to have empathy and sympathy towards one another. When one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. When one part of the body is honored, we all rejoice. So here's the thing. Let's go deeper in our love for God and for one another. Not only being the bridge but also being the sledgehammer. To be able to look at our own hearts and remove whatever can stop us from loving God and one another the way he wants us to. We live in a world that we are different, but you know, in those differences, we can glorify God. But Jesus needs to come first. Before I am a Filipino American, I am a child of God. I live in L.A., I live in the United States, but I'm part of something bigger, the kingdom of God. Though I may have a president, you may have a president, but we have a king, and his name is Jesus. And those differences that we have can either divide us or bring us together and glorify God even more so. That was the message of Paul. So my challenge to you, as we leave here today, when you see hatred, when you see bigotry, when you see prejudice, take a stand and speak up against the sin. If it's in your heart, repent, remove the walls of anything that can cause us to be more fearful than faithful. Let the Spirit of God guide you in your next steps. And I pray that these conversations will help you grow deeper in your love for God and for one another.
comes from Jesus. Paul says he was compelled, and I hope you and I are compelled today. I leave you with this one last scripture, and it's an, it's an imagination. Let the Spirit of God guide you in your next steps. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, as Jesus was giving a vision of, to, to John, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude, that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. See, the dream that Jesus showed John then was an imagination. It was a dream that no matter how different you and I are, no matter what our experiences, how different they may be, no matter where we come from, what our background is, the dream that John was given is one of unity in Christ. And that is the same dream that he gives you and I today. That's our call here, I know, in America. We're hurting. We're crying. But you know what? The Spirit of God is moving. And as I go deeper in my love for God, and I go deeper in my love for one another, I pray that there will be a light that will help people see that what we have is temporary, but through Jesus, we have hope. I want to say thank you so much again for allowing my son and I to join you today. Philippine Family Church is your special church, special family in the kingdom of God. And whatever you're going through, continue with all your heart to be the light. You've impacted many people. You've given hope to many people and continue to do so. There's a reason why God has you where you are today. You are the church. Your community is your mission field. Your relationships that you have are a testimony of opportunities to grow deep in your love with one another that can give hope to people. Whatever hardships that you and I go through, may we use it to glorify God. Whatever walls of hostility are out there, Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our answer. And today, you and I have an opportunity to be the light to this dark world. May God continue to bless you. May you let the Spirit of God move. And wherever the Spirit of God is calling you, participate and do your best to shine. God bless you.